Jeff, I understand why you're mad, but I also think no, that you might be looking into the details of it rather than the theory of it. And I'm looking at the theory of it saying that in theory, you want something and it should work. The details, you know, whether it's 30 seconds, one minute, you know, two minutes, or if it's not after the objective, or it's, you know, if it's only timeouts, I mean, that is detail orientated. But the point is, what stands true is in theory, if you're going to build an esports, you need to build players, stars, storylines, and make it fun to watch. And you're not going to be able to do that if you've just got a constant flow of gameplay, which is too fast to a commentate or highlight on the whole team and what they did other than cool, they're here. Now they're here. Nice rocket. I'm uh, sorry, but I, I guarantee you Overwatch will be so boring to watch if it's just like a whole true game you know apart from they'll talk in between maps maps like it, the game itself won't have yeah but the problem is i feel like you well, miss so much well if, you if can you're talking between well, production when you're talking between maps, you're talking show about relevant information when you're talking between maps you're irrelevant information how many people actually fucking listen to panels the post game uh, commentary uh, yeah unless it's foreign going mental or me <laughs> and jeff doing stupid things with monster energy drink right if you actually listen to the panel when they analyze about the game everyone's like fuck this because it's not the primary source of the storyline to the esport when the panel's going mental what they're actually doing is is they're creating um publicity for themselves if the panel was staying on track and doing uh, talking only about the game that's the riot way but you, you need a you need a whole lot of money to do a whole big production to make that experience as your esport production to feel like okay i'm watching something grand and i shouldn't tune out because this is amazing from start to finish um so if you do post game analysis and talk about the match after the game the information just doesn't feel that relevant or fun anymore um and i don't think blizzard have the insight I would sorry, that's a bad maybe word to say to you know understand that if they're going to do really high production and they're, they're going to have to throw millions of dollars and they're going to have to make it feel like the coolest thing to watch. Okay, um, yeah. let's well let's kind of wrap that up so we can move on a little bit to how uh, how Blizzard has handled the I guess release of these betas. Um, uh oh, <laughs> this is I guess this is where the little bit of the the drama part comes here. Just but, a little but, bit. But St Stephen, like, what do you think about? Uh, well, what how, what do you think about the process of how they've given out the betas? Um, but more so than how they've I guess communicated it, how they've done that. Um, I mean, like that. I, well, that's really the only thing they did wrong, though. I feel like I, I feel like they did the beta exactly as they would have expected. You give keys to popular streamers and shit to hype the mm -hmm, game, and then right. if you know someone at Blizzard, you get a key just because it's how it works. Uh, but I mean, isn't I figured that that's how it would go. But uh, the problem, I guess, is that apparently, I, and I haven't seen these statements myself. Maybe James or um, Jeff might know more. But but apparently, Blizzard was saying that they were going to distribute the keys evenly, and they weren't going to prefer streamers or whatever. If they actually said that, that was pretty stupid to say. I didn't hear. No, anything. they never said that. Are you sure? Because there's a lot of fucking mad people on that subreddit saying that Blizzard said that. Well, there there was always reference to a friends and family list, and then there was like another bucket that was like. Oh, on Reddit are mad and sane things. Jesus. No, like, have you seen? Have you been to the Overwatch subreddit? Yes, I have. It's <laughs> actually insane. The the brine levels there are actually. It's like fucking like if you were to geographically map out like the entire internet, that would be the Dead Sea. Like it is so fucking salty in there. It's actually insane. Um, I've never seen salt levels. Salt levels like that shouldn't be humanly possible, but. So I just assumed after reading it all, I just assumed that I guess Blizzard made some statements on the best because that's what everybody says. No, that's the thing. I think they actually got very bad PR because of it. Um, yeah. Because, for example, Blizzard are like, okay, we're going to invite these people. And it was pretty obvious that everyone knew if they were invited if they were a streamer, right? So uh, you had, you had um, what's his face? Uh, Towley was basically just streaming YouTube content of Overwatch <laughs> that was it, yeah. with, with like 20,000 viewers. And then, you know, everyone was like getting it. Like, I... I sent in a list of six people and, you know, I, we only actually got one of them from the six. So, you know, not, I, I, so I think there were a very small amount of streamers that were like, I know I've got it. There were a lot of people that were like, I might get it. And then there were the community members where people, some of them got it, which was a very small percent. And then a lot of them didn't get it. And because, they, because they didn't kind of like say it was like how big or small it was going to be everyone got pretty upset and i think that rightfully so i think that if you're blizzard and you're you're saying anything about doing a closed beta if you say we're doing a closed beta and we're trying to get in um 
uh, streamers because we want to see their feedback because it's like focus testing on the internet and competitive players from different games because we want them to help balance the game. So this is like a stage one beta where we're trying to get as much information from a, a core group of players to move later into stage two. But they just basically said, this is a closed beta. And, you know, everyone was like, oh, cool. And then it's like, no, no, no one's getting in. So I think they did themselves a really um, a bad PR job. I linked a tweet in the group chat. I don't know if, can you see that? I know Jeff should be able yeah, to. Son. Son. Yeah, if they've made statements like that, like I can understand why people would be pretty salty because that statement is markedly false, I would say. Yeah, I feel like, you know, my opinion on it as an obvious non-expert on how the hell this goes on, I don't know the, I don't know how Blizzard's strategy plan with this or anything like that, but I would, I, I agree with James, I think in spirit that as far as at least publicity is concerned, you really just have to be concise with these kind of things because mm -hmm. even ambiguity is toxic. Like even even yeah, that was you know, the problem. It's yeah. like I look at that tweet that you just said, and it says you have the same chance as anyone, and they did give out random keys to non-streamers. That's a markedly false statement, though. If you hey, were a big streamer, Jay, don't I fucking let, yeah, 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 okay. just I just I just I go go for it. Yep. My point <laughs> is. They obviously also targeted streamers and gave them keys. So no, not everyone has an equal chance, but there were people who are not big streamers that did get keys. So that was like the safety argument that Blizzard would try to make where they're like, no, look, those people did get keys. It just so happens a lot of people were also targeted. So that's where the ambiguity comes in. You have to come out with a message that says, look, guys, we very obviously are going to give it to big streamers because that's one of the best ways to put it in front of the most people's faces while giving it to the fewest people. But we're also going to randomly select other people. So check your emails, check your account. There's a chance you could get it. But for right yep. now, it's going to be limited. If and they come with that message, then there's going to be people that are like, I was raised to believe everyone's a special snowflake. And I deserve the same opportunity as Summit, who's streaming to 30 fucking thousand people right now. And I, I won't stream to five. You know, And like, obviously, those kind of people are going to be mad no matter what. But at least there's a clear message out there so that there's not a river or, as Steven said, a dead sea of people that is angry. Yeah, we also have to um, understand that even from a PR point, which is what, you know, in terms of advertisement, Jeff's correct. But you also have to think if you're a developer and you've got streamers coming to you that have done a lot for different games, like Tally streamed a lot of World of Warcraft, mm -hmm. you know, so that like uh, Soda Pop in a, and, and Wreckful and they've all, you know, a lot of them played Hearthstone, right? They've done essentially a lot of marketing for your franchise and games and built fan bases and, and encourage people to play with them in sub days or whatever. So as a, if a streamer comes to you and you're the game developer and says, hey, look, I'd really want to like to get in. And you're like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, we you know, <laughs> to treat uh, you the same as, yeah, as another I, gamer. You know, they're going to also yeah. just be angry at you as well. And and the other thing is, it's like there's already a line of communication with these people. Um, you know, I, I like, there's, for example, you know, I'm sure that there's different lines of communication between different streamers and people that have done stuff for Blizzard games and Blizzard. So they already have their own kind of ways of giving feedback already, right? So they know it works. Mm -hmm. They know there's people that they like out there that have done a lot for their games. There's also people that they might not like testing their games, right? Uh, for example, I put my name in for the Heroes of the Storm uh, beta, but because I, uh, because I said something on uh, Twitter, I actually got my email removed <laughs> from the uh, invite list when it came back to the person that submitted it they were like yes on all of these no on this email right um so i've been really nice about overwatch uh so far <laughs> but yeah i don't think anybody point, disagrees the point being it's like yeah there's a there's a side of it which is marketing and pr and there's a side of it which is a lot of people have done stuff and it's just good business and yeah yeah so. i mean yeah i don't think anybody cool. disagrees that like streamers are obviously gonna be the ones to get the keys but it's just about being consistent with yeah and it, it is don't exactly make what jeff said. It's, yeah it's what jeff said is yeah, yeah. yeah, don't and make and don't make messages that say and then and again that's not even a bigger don't don't tweet out saying oh yeah you have the same chance as anyone else when that's when that's obviously not true like why would you shoot yourself in the foot like that like yeah. the, the the position of streamers are getting keys because we get big public feedback it raises awareness for a game like those are all totally uh totally legit and valid reasons like yeah just say that and that's it and then you're good to go so have they been clear about you know uh how the next few waves are going to come out because the second wave came out the day the next day which uh which actually was on the second wave not the first wave have they been have they said how, how it's going to go or is it just going to be like day to day type of thing i haven't i haven't really seen anything i haven't either 
I think we all got our beta keys, so we didn't like check in and scrutinize the process, right? <laughs> I feel I feel like if it if yeah. they had released an official statement, I feel like it would have seen it on the Overwatch subreddit. So that makes me feel like they haven't. I could be wrong though. Well, if anything, it gives them. I think it gives people more hope that that they see some waves coming out, you know, from day to day instead of like week to week. It is an okay. interesting phenomenon though, because there have been betas that Blizzard have done before where it didn't have this reaction, which is so interesting because the beta actually, by the way, was launched super smooth. The game is really polished. It's really fun to play. Like there are bugs, mm -hmm. there have been downtime issues, but for the most part, very minimal. The biggest like limelight issue has just been all these people that I guess thought that they were going to get in that did not. And that, mm -hmm. and it's, it's definitely a lesson learned. And I'm, I assure you Blizzard, you know, and they're all seeing eye notices this and we'll probably learn and, and do better next time. But that, that seems to have been like the subreddit, but it's also all over Twitter. Like you, you can't go mm -hmm. two feet without hearing the name soda poppin, uh, which is close, <laughs> I think in the story to what James is talking about and why he didn't get into the heroes of the storm. Uh, so like, like those kind of issues, do you really want that to be your big topic on, on your beta launch? I don't think so. So I, I, I expect this to be a learning process, I think for everyone involved. One thing that kind of sucks um, to reiterate what James said earlier is that um, if you do something, if you do something well, people don't really notice. Considering that this is Blizzard's like first FPS, it, it does feel yeah, really, really good and really polished. Like props to like everybody that worked on the game and the art team and everything too. Um, that's oh, uh, that's always been a really strong point in Blizzard as well. Like the art that they've had for all of their games has been really good. When you talk about like particle effects, like not getting in the way, that's something that I specifically remember the StarCraft II devs talking about when when they were designing StarCraft. That their artists could have done like 50 million more. More spectacular effects went up but for clarity in the game you know they were really careful in how they did everything and the game plays well and none of the heroes feel like buggy or anything and everything runs smooth and yeah that's really good yeah i think they definitely knocked it out the park for the first go at fps but i also wasn't this the um uh kind of continuation after the titan project didn't go through I, I don't think, does anybody know publicly <laughs> and what, no how fun. far that got? For all we know, this could be built off of StarCraft Ghost. We <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> don't really know. In my, in my head, they had a deal to do something with that project, and then it didn't happen, and then they did this. Maybe they used some of the, yeah, I don't know, it's possible. But even, but even if that is true, I mean, Titanfall or Titan I, I, I would have been their first been, go This has been in the works for, like, or at least the FPS side of the company has been in works for a very long time. Yeah, but even so, like, their their Diablo launch was disastrous, oh, right? Oh, like, God. Mm, gosh. But for this beta, it's been, I think, minus the PR snafu, it's been one of the smoothest beta launches I've ever seen. Like, it's just... Yeah. This game could launch tomorrow, and I think a lot of people would, it would be fun. gladly buy it and play it and have a great time. Well, people are buying right now. I think somebody's looking at eBay. People are spending um, two or 300 bucks on beta keys. Wow. <laughs> well, you would have to be the whole account. You, there's no oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah there's, there's selling the account. Selling the account. Oh, selling the whole account. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Did you guys um? Go ahead. Did you guys see the thing that I tweeted? The guy that um. There was a guy doing a twenty-five dollar beta access to his account, and some guy like went full detective mode and busted him, and then posted it on the Reddit. He's like, "I caught this guy selling his account for twenty-five dollars." Good. Good. <laughs> yeah. That kind of shit should get caught. We. Oh uh, man. We, so there's an article, by the way. There's an article on. Oh, whoa, 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 hold on. Whoa. Totally cut whoa. Jeff off. He was in line. Good. Lord. Right. Yeah. I was just. I'm ADD. ADD. <laughs> You're. <laughs> what? This is really shocking because cues are, cues are supposed to be really important to you guys over there across the sea, all right? Right. I wasn't even listening to you guys. James, James, rude is spelled R-U-D-E, not A-D-D, buddy. Uh, real quick, maybe to get to your probably just wandering discussion of whatever the fuck's on your mind at that moment. Uh, we were playing like 10 minutes into day one beta, and we played against a team that... That this guy had first wave access to Overwatch, and his name was Mr. Nig 4000. <laughs> We're like, this guy's like on a friends and family Blizzard plan or something. That was the name he, he's like, oh yeah, fuck, yeah, that's it. That's my identity. It's so weird. Go ahead. Go ahead, James. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. All right. <laughs> Can't follow that. Okay, well. But oh, there's a, someone posted an um, uh, interesting article in, in Polygon, which is like how they turn the Titan failure into the next, you know, uh, big FPS. 
And so it was from Titan that they were working on. And I was teased long ago by someone at Blizzard, like saying like, yeah, we're, we're going to do something for your, really up your street. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what's up my street Blizzard game? Was and it, was Titan supposed to be an MMO or no? Well, it was meant to be an FPS no, MMO or something. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I wasn't wrong. I don't know. Yeah, I really don't MMO have any information. It would, have, it would have been cool if they would have set up some kind of show match exhibition kind of thing at BlizzCon. There's nothing like that, right? Scheduled on for Overwatch. Yeah, it was Polygon. So. Yeah, that would have been pretty fun to see. And then, that's really strange that they wouldn't yeah. showcase it during BlizzCon. I mean, I'm sure it'll be there, but I, yeah. but to Chris's question, I don't think there's an organized show match. But they had, I don't know. I'm a, I'm actually more. I'm pretty okay with that. They had like a they did that for Heroes mm -hmm. with a bunch of guys that like now are nowhere near Heroes. Like it was it was pretty soulless. Yeah. Okay. But all right. Um, that's Overwatch. Let's move on to just some general gaming genre or uh, the future of gaming genres uh, discussion. And this kind of this the genesis of this uh, topic has to do with uh, Jeff writing an article for uh, it's. Let me see the, the follow esports right followesports.com, and it was basically talking about the history of RTS and uh, basically saying that StarCraft Two is is the last of you know, the last of the RTS games, or at least the traditional RTS games. Um, and it kind of, you know, made me, you know, a lot of the things that you said in the articles uh, were, were really good points. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that and see if you, the the other two, you, you two guys agree with the fact that StarCraft II is probably going to be the last, you know, last kind of RTS game where we see, you know, just this this type of, uh, you know, resources building, you know, from, from the get-go and then, you know, just, just what, we've, what we've seen for a long time with Warcraft and StarCraft. Um, so Jeff, why don't you start off with just uh, just your article? Like, um, the point of it... Just class, like, Jeff. Yeah. yeah, so I guess the, the micro point of it and that we're extrapolating to the bigger point is just that RTS is a genre. I, I, and I, by the way, this is the asterisk, but, like, I had to make a poignant article. Otherwise, no one cares if I'm like, anybody else think that RTS genre is just a little bit more lackluster than it used to be? Like, Nobody cares about that. So I said, yeah. anybody else think that RTS is dying? <laughs> Whoa! But to a certain extent, it is. Like, Grey Goo comes out. It's an absolute, it's a poopy RTS. just not very good at all. I disagree. Uh, I thought the RTS was fine. The marketing was bad, and it was really expensive. But I thought it was yeah. a decent game. That's not the first time you've been wrong today. But, you know, it's one of them. <laughs> Did uh, you even play Grey Goo? Steven, exactly. Was... Fucking continue on. Carry on. Carry on. Go ahead. I was at the booth that launched Grey Goo, and I played it afterwards after the devs gave me the access to the game. Yes, I, I played it quite a bit. So that's a no. That's a, that's a, I got paid a bunch of money like Rotterdam to showcase the space game and sit in the booth. Grey Goo was a decent game. I'll defend the game. Go ahead. Hey. Um, so I want to, my two. I'm just getting away from Grey Goo. Let's I'll just sum it up for you guys. Okay. He sensationalized it, said it's dead. Oh, pretty my much God. correct. But I do think that there's a design problem with an RTS that needs uh, to be. Uh, are we not going to let Jeff even talk we'll about his that. article? Jeff, Jeff, his article, like, who fucking cares? Dude, you're like a old grandfather. I want to I wanna leave. I've got other shit to do. I have thoughts on this. Unbelievable. Right. Grego first crossed my mind in the summer of 1984 when I was. Having sex with a woman at the time whose bosom could could branch on the subject of yachts. I bet <laughs> Mrs. Robinson would cool her. I think I was talking about Greg Goo. Anyways, Greg Goo. Fucking hell, James. All right. I'm just real like... quick for James Ben. <laughs> uh, yes. That's somewhere to go. It's 9 p.m. There's fucking a truck stop somewhere that this guy's got to <laughs> suck some shit at. So let's get this done. Okay. Uh, the subject is RTS is dying for the most part. Apparently, Destiny and his cronies really liked Grey Goo, but for, unfortunately, everybody else thinks it's shit. It's not doing well. Nobody's playing. It's a bad game. Uh, before that, you have almost nothing. People will be like, oh, no, there was this great RTS that I found that was made by a German company. No, okay, not, nothing really. Halo Wars is rumored to come out again, but it's going to be for console because they don't want to compete with StarCraft, and StarCraft might be the final word on RTS. So as far as genres go... There are booming big ones like MOBAs that are crushing it between uh, LOL and Dota. And then there's been 5,000 attempts at replicating that experience, but they've mostly failed. I think Heroes is the most successful non-failure, I guess, attempt at going into the MOBA scene after those two. Watch out, don't and get then... that Overwatch key revoked. 
There you go, Steven. Uh, and then uh, other than that, there's other genres that are like FPS has always done well. COD has been kind of been there. That's not true. That's FPS has always done well. In the early rise of the MOBAs, FPS was pretty much dead in the water before CSGO made a resurgence. Would you, James, would you agree with that? Well, there's a difference Sorry. between team. Dead in the water, did you say? Yeah, pr pretty much. Do you smoke aside from head? aside from Call of Duty, which has like a monopoly on console? Before CS:GO came back, nobody was talking about FPS like seriously. It was just the year of the fucking mobas. Do, do you just ja okay? Too good. Do you disagree? Was, with uh, I think you're talking I'm, about the time when I'm Call of Duty out on your thirty million copies at midnight on the day before they launch. Is that the time where nobody was talking about FPS? Aside from console, in terms of like PC gaming. Aside from Call of Duty, which is which is like the only fucking console shit that anybody cares about, right? But before CS:GO came back, professional FPS was pretty lackluster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. professional yeah. FPS didn't really. Did you guys hear that? Thank you, thank you. Too good, Matt. But he's got oh, FPS yeah, experience. That's yeah, but... why it's I wanted true. to make a fucking FPS game because I was like, oh, in yeah. so many years' time, people are going to be hungry for a good FPS game, and then thank everyone you. brought back FPS. And, and Fortress then, was being yeah. played; it wasn't competitive. Battlefield was being played; it wasn't competitive. Starcraft was being played and competitive. MOBAs were being played and competitive, and even World of Warcraft that started dying off, Bloodline Champions came in and actually took a niche in esports as one of the small games, right? So, mm -hmm. yes, Destiny's correct. But the thing is, like, when you're talking about RTS being a genre that people are like, okay, this is not that popular, people will get hungry for it again. And it's, it's again, it's a design problem, I was right? talking about esports, but it was genres. That's why it's yes, so weird. Yes. So the the RTS yeah. the RTS yeah. genre will come back, and if it, if RTS genre was to come back strongest, I think it would be Warcraft Four with heroes and an army. And I think that the economy system in the base, in terms of actually mining, I actually think that you should have automatic. You might guys might hate this. But okay, let's treat base building and micro similar to how Heroes of the Storm and other people do it, which is. I would have people just mining automatically wood, trees, whatever, gold and minerals. And then I would have like an option just to set different um, um, kind of income per minute on those free variables that I just click to set. So if, I, into, want if, I, if, I, want, so if I want to build giants and I want to build this and I want to build that, I would just like modify my base um, kind of income, you know, priority to quickly adapt to the opponent in terms of what I can build. And I think that having heroes in RTS game is is still amazing because it gives a central point for a spectator oh. to focus on. All right, Jeff. This is, is not what the is... subject was about. James. No, <laughs> yeah, but, like, you're saying RTS is dead. RTS as a genre isn't no, well. No, we were talking about I wanted to use my article as a jumping platform to talk about exactly. all the genres. Exactly. Right, yeah, you're writing some kind of fix RTS. I'm talking RTS. Way, yes. I can talk about every genre. shit I've heard today. You're like, no, but the thing is, <laughs> RTS. RTS one at a time. One at a time. Uh, to okay. fix the RTS genre as a guy that's been building a game for 10 years, let me just say, I believe <laughs> the you thing is, like, on Jeff, your listen, own. Jeff, Jeff, listen. As someone that's worked in this oh industry and done so much in terms of knowing everything about different genres and study this and write shit on this and fucking do contribute to many of the top companies, different genres is what makes esports first, right? And then community wants what? come around later. No, the thing, this is all you need to know about esports and genres, Jeff. You need to know that there are playable genres, which we have to actually have a connection with, like sports, okay? So the thing is, we can all watch different sports because we're like, we understand what this person is doing. You know, we understand that. And because we all grew up playing RTS as very young, it was very easy for Command & Conquer and June and all these games to transition us into StarCraft, Warcraft 3, and then um starcraft 2 as an esport and every single genre that we've got in esports right now is born out of something that we grew up playing but there's also a new genre of gamers that are 14 years old that are going to play something different so if rts is going to if rts is going to have a, a, a comeback it needs to take elements that new players will want to enjoy and it will come back rts will come back with a big game in esports probably in three to four years time similar to how fps is going to obviously come back with the way it did with Counter-Strike because it's a genre that we can appreciate that becomes more of a sport because we understand the meta of the game and understand how to watch it as a spectator. And the only new esports that ever really got invented was pretty much a MOBA, which was 
you know, well, as a genre, it was basically the hero side of Warcraft Three. Okay, so that's you know, you bring up a good point there. So, the so the thing, thing is, if you are going to talk about, no, about no, no, genres, no. what's dead and what's not, there's no fucking point because it's it's like we know what's going to happen, no, right? It's not, it's not I, about, I, it's not about I actually talking, disagree with it. It's not a talking about whether a genre is dead or not. What I wanted to get to and if you want RTS to come back, someone has to redesign the elements of RTS that actually make it playable for a. It's about evolution. But that's that's about evolution, James. Right. Well, no, no, no. That's that's not even necessarily true either. I feel like. I feel like the most important part is the developer behind it. Because like if you look at CSGO, CSGO is a game that has a lot of elements that are not found in FPSs today, right? Most FPSs today, it feels to me, like if you look at things like Titanfall and and, and Far Cry and whatever, whatever, any other like FPS comes out, they try to emulate the Call of Duty thing, which is where you have like this very quick run and gun. Um, the guns come up quick and you run and you strafe around and, and everything is like really super fucking fast and high pace. And if you compare that to CSGO, CSGO as an FPS stands out like, not stands out, but it's very, very different than any other FPS, such that, like, if you were to look at Go back when it was very lackluster and not many people were watching it and MOBAs were pretty much the dominant, followed by RTS um, esports, I, I feel like a lot of people would have said the same things there that you're saying about RTS, that you need to go back and completely redesign CSGO, and that kind of FPS just doesn't work today. Like, you can't have set spray patterns, and you have to be able to run and shoot people, and, like, all of these things, they worked in, in 1.6 and, you know, earlier games, but it's just not for today's age like i feel like if you have good developer support that's willing to patch and support a game and, and, and do all the things that valve has done to support csgo i feel like you could make a traditional rts work yeah it, it, yeah you i mean it's a it's a huge combination factor and also the fact that counter-strike had all these amazing personalities media trained on twitter ready to mm -hmm. go for csgo and the community was hungry for new storylines in esports i mean people said like james aren't you pissed off you didn't release your your game this year or last year i was like no i'm not because if no one would give a shit about my game if i released it because everyone's busy watching counter-strike go maybe next year people you know might be like oh, okay you know I've seen these two teams play a hundred times now. Maybe I quite fancy watching a different storyline and of a different game with a different skill set. Um, you know, and, and that's you know, th there's going to be that natural cycle. And Jeff, not to you know rudely interrupt you as I did before, but I, I've had so many conversations about different genres in esports and, and how they happen. It seems to be all you know absorbing in terms of anything I do consultancy uh, wise and how to make esports you know actually work for different companies. But to sum up your very you know baseline point of your article i mean what are you trying to state i mean what's what are you saying that's happening <laughs> wow well, we're, circ go ahead, back to this. You know, we're circling back to the original reason why i was trying oh, to have jeff talk about like his article i'm not even sure if jeff even got to talk about his exactly. article <laughs> all right jeff starting again all right <laughs> baseline with rts so your it's point about subject but the the whole baseline point and i think this is what chris wanted to make into the larger discussion which hopefully we still can <laughs> is just that the rts genre right now is not what gamers are necessarily looking for to play like it's too punishing it's too patient it's slow it, it's meticulous and it it's not doesn't have a lot of the immediate gratification it's not easily mm -hmm. accessible in the sense that like if i sit down and look at a team shooting at each other or two guys punching and kicking each other that makes a lot more sense for me. And then, of course, the other model of, is MOBA, where it is just as confusing, but most of their view, or a large part of their viewership is the player base, which is astronomical in comparison to most other games. Yeah. That, well, I yeah. mean, every game except for like one, basically. Yeah. So the player, so the player base. I think let, let's focus on that. So with with you know every era of gaming, right? I mean, the the player base dictates a lot of, as to what types of games work. And like right now, you know, what we've seen in gaming is we've seen like in the last 10 years, mobile gaming has become giant and, you know, just a giant thing. Casual gaming has become probably bigger than it's ever been. And I feel like that's leaking in to what we consider esport titles and, and what, what we think people want to see. So here's a question. Um, but is, it works it, too, to that yeah, point. Yeah, is MOBA, you know, I, I, I think of genres of games like, you know, just being evolved. So is MOBA the latest evolution in RTS? I mean, is, is that what what's happened, or what? Those these are totally different. No, games no, I'm just saying. Like, no, yeah, but but the thing is, when I explain different genres to like investors and stuff, and try to explain to them like what genres matter and and how you can kind of uh, you know work with this, I actually say 
that rather than saying MOBA, I say that MOBA is basically team RTS. Right, exactly. Um, and that means that they kind of get it um, because they still have that mm-hmm. connection with RTS, two bases, you know, yes. etc. So, so that's the question. I mean, it's, it's not team RTS because team RTS, you would both have armies that you would build, and, you know, etc. But it's, it is, it's, it, you know, it's. I mean, if that's your way of explaining idea. it, but I mean, they're like fundamentally completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah, it's. Yeah. No, I think unless you're using like Warcraft as a person, sorry, Ron. No, which is kind of interesting is I I do think like a Warcraft four will be the next big RTS, and then further down the line like a Starcraft three. But I think for the most part, and this is kind of unique to the to the genre, I want to say, I don't really see any other company looking at the RTS space and saying this is where we're going to develop a game. It would be it would be crazy. I mean, it would be crazy to spend a lot of money in an RTS game as a developer to create an esport unless you are Blizzard. I mean. one of the reasons we've actually talked about being able to do an RTS at our studio. And the only reason we think that we would ever try and do it is because we could spend maybe just quarter of a million, half a million pounds. And if we did it correctly with the right people and we improved the design and kind of the entry barrier into the game and, and still kept that RTS and with all the connections we have, we could probably turn over a million to two million, right? Um, but that's the only reason that we could take that risk on it. But then Blizzard, if they're doing Warcraft 4, boom, guaranteed. Anyone else doing an RTS, unless it's just like 100% better than what anyone thought it was going to be and got kind of viral and, you know, and good marketing and good price and, yeah, and, 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 and the combination sell it on and, and then yeah. it would be, you know, and, you know, it, you know, I know it sounds really stupid for me to say like, yeah, I, you know, want, you know, would love to make an RTS, but it was always something I had in the back of my mind, you know, after we, you know, finished the first game and if Apollo or someone was still working with us, you know, we just do it the esport route, which is talk to everybody you know, try and see what we uh, would learn. And uh, and if you gave something good to the community as a developer with all the free-to-play, you know, cosmetic microtransactions, you know, development mm-hmm. support, and also pay for some of the esports, which I think is a necessity right now, um, you would probably turn over your money. And, you know, making a video game for half a million dollars is a joke in comparison to what gets spent on a lot of uh, big esport titles, but also for a lot of indie game developers that if they make the right decision, half a million dollars is actually a shit ton of money. Um, yeah. So it is possible. Yeah, um, definitely agree with you that it's, it's but, but I agree with what Jeff said. Risk. RTS yeah. RTS isn't necessarily what people are looking to play these days in terms of instant gratification, how it plays, how it feels, the pace of it. It's uh, it's kind of the same reason people don't play Quake 1v1. Um, yep. you know, they kind of get in. Like I watch a lot of people play Quake just to see if I can learn what they do. And basically there's no point watching 1v1 players because they're not playing Quake. It's a different game, 1v1 yeah. Quake. They're actually just playing free for all and they don't know how to jump and they don't use the mechanics. And you know, it's you can't judge the player base of making a 1v1 esport game off, you know, who plays Quake Free for And Jeff's correct. And but I think what will happen is it's a design problem if and and a combination with developers like Destiny said, like who's doing it, that will bring us back into is this a new, enjoyable RTS experience? And I predict the only ones that can really do it uh, easily would be um, would be Blizzard with the franchise Warcraft. So, you know, some of the comments about just getting a little bit into the details as to, you know, some of the things that, uh, you know, maybe we're referring to why Warcraft 4 would work. Um, is the economic side of, the, just the macro side of the RTS game the, the most unappealing part of this genre? Jeff, me. question huh? to you: Like, is is the is the macroing side of this genre the most unappealing part to the general public or the general gaming, uh, the gamer community right now? I, I I don't really know. I mean, you're I I haven't like pulled people on it. I, my speculation would just be that the overall experience of an RTS is really hard. Like, it's it's at a core one v one, which is also mm-hmm. uh, kind of the less popular format right now. Team games seem to be the bigger one, and it's just punishing. It takes time to get into the game. Once you get into the game, uh, there's so many things happening that if you don't understand what they're doing to make those things happen, then you don't really appreciate it as much either. So it's just, yeah. there's all these entries to barrier or barriers to entry, excuse me. But be- it, it has a background because Starcraft has been around since 1998. So there's a lot of people that do you know it well enough that will watch it, but they're not the new generation. Do you like the direction that Starcraft's taking with like, like see the void? With some of the macro mechanics being removed and that that sort of thing, I never, I don't really think in those terms. Like, mm-hmm. obviously, I'm a Brood War guy, so I, right. I like an even harder game. But I also recognize mm-hmm. that look at all the transformation of games. Like, all games for the most part are getting more user friendly, or the less PC, you know, they're harder to play. 
and yeah. that's just the changing of the tide like there's no more battle toads type games coming out like <laughs> metal gear solid comes out and it's the easiest version of itself since yeah. since ever and that's just the generation of all games right now yeah. if you mm-hmm. come out with a really hard game like and I, I have to say like one of the only ones that's kind of an outlier of that is uh what is that fu- steven you played this game a bunch of watch you play it i'm just blanking on the name it's super famous the one where you're a knight and you fucking die all the time oh dark souls dark souls dark oh. souls is like a really weird it shows that that people will still play it and like it, but I don't know, not enough developers taking a shot at. It, but that game's super fucking hard, and you die all the time. But it's not multiplayer. It's not multiplayer. You're right. So um, it, it has a different like niche to it. But I agree with you. Yeah, it's. Uh, but I think the reason that like why you say it's a combination of things, and you wouldn't be able to. Um, um, yeah, you'd need to talk to a lot of people to figure out why. But I think that what's happening with the new games that are being developed is they're very much are trying to focus on something and do something very well. Um, so, for example, this FPS game, you know, that uh, Overwatch is meant to be um, high teamwork and high skill in, in kind of shooting, right? Um, and it, it's meant to just do those things well. And then um, if you look at... Um, uh, Heroes of the Storm, a new game. Um, it's meant to be just high teamwork and high coordination. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, if you look at StarCraft, what you need to be is like high, high, mi- macro, micro decision making. You know, fast. It's it's got too much stuff. Um, and so, a particular kind of player in a multiplayer game will go, "I love it all. I want to master everything." And that's why it's the small gamer base. But if you were to say, like, well, what's an RTS meant to deliver as an experience? Well, people like building. People like deciding on what to build, you know, and people like the fights with the armies. People like having, you know, like, and you you kind of key focus on what's uh, crucial to what you're trying to sell in the RTS. And that's, I think, like, why Jeff probably didn't mind, you know, the minerals, you know, or the the man, the, your uh, workers automatically, you know, working at the beginning is because, like, for Jeff, he would probably be able to play, you know, anyway, right? It doesn't really affect his game because his game is so high level. It's about decision making and, and what he's doing and map control and vision. But for a new player, that's a huge difference mm-hmm. in terms of um, helping them get in. So I think you need to take that kind of philosophy and then increase it, but still deliver what is core to the RTS for it to come back as a genre. So I, I think when, when you talk about games aren't being made hard, I think games are being more uh, designed with a focus to deliver the experience. And there are exceptions out of it that have kind of stayed around because of how awesome they are uh, with the, you know, Dota 2. Mm-hmm. Um, but even Dota 2, you know, even though it does everything, you know, League of Legends is bigger because it removes a couple of things. You know, it's a little bit I, more... I, I really but, actually, I get triggered. I wouldn't compare Dota 2 to an RTS at all. Dota 2 is... No, much. Dota 2, I compare Dota 2 and League of Legends. League of Legends. Yeah, the differences. Yeah. She's sure. saying it's an easier one to play for the most part, so it's... Sure. Yeah, yeah, less yeah, item yeah. actives, I guess, and less punishing uh, heroes. But making making these decisions and trying to keep the skill in your game and, and what it's trying to do is is a really hard uh, part of game development. And I think Blizzard have done an amazing job with Overwatch, right? I think it's very high skill cap and it's very focused on you know team team orientation. And because they haven't done co op and different lots of different crazy game modes, they've got a very uh, you know well designed packaged game. Sure, it can be based off you know many different. Uh, other FPS games, you know, every, every, no one's got an original idea, I don't think, anymore in game development. But, you know, they've done it well. They focused and they've delivered a good product. And, kind of okay. that point and I think you can do the same with RTS. Specifically, yeah. what's hard about RTS, I agree with everything James said, is if you make an RTS too easy, which is really ironic, or and it's an invisible threshold, we don't know where that exists, but if you make it too easy, it's not. It's not an attractive game at all, and yeah. I, I would mm-hmm. argue that that's where yeah. kind of great goo fell. And there's not a ton of micro. A lot of the units are symmetrical across the board to a certain extent. Uh, the capital units that you can only have one of are like way overpowered, but so fucking slow that they over they overbalance them. Like things like that, but they did it to be more user friendly. Makes the RTS experience really bland. Like you want to be challenged in the RTS, but if you're too challenged. Then you're kind of like, I'm okay watching it. I don't want to play it as much, which then doesn't sell as many copies and people aren't playing it for as long, which is so unique about StarCraft. It, it's, And that's what they try to do with StarCraft 2 and are trying to do is take the Brood War experience of the most hardcore, difficult game to play, but also like the paramount competitive game. And then they're trying to make it also semi-user friendly and good for the newbies so that they have something to do too and don't feel too punished. 
And I think they've done the best job that an RTS can of like walking that line. They've obviously dipped too high and dipped too low a few times and people will comment on that. But for the most part, people still play StarCraft at a semi-healthy level, whereas all other RTSs have fallen off. Yeah, agreed. I, I actually think StarCraft 2 is in the best state that it's ever been um, as a game. But the, uh, yeah, but a lot of that you don't know if you can... As well. It's hard how much you can, not to shit on StarCraft 2, but it's it's impossible to know how much you can attribute to the fact that the StarCraft 2 design versus the fact that it's just that Blizzard IP. Because StarCraft could have been released as anything and would have enjoyed some form of success. Sure. Just the same way that Warcraft could be released as literally anything and will enjoy some form of success and will sell. It's, you know, it's a different many. time, too. You know, yeah. When StarCraft 2 came out, it, it was a different, completely different time in, from the standpoint of the gamer base. Um, so but... here's a question, I guess, for James, I guess, as a developer or whatever. Why do you think that, um, since it seems, so like, here's something that I think most of us agree on. Designing a game for competitive people runs counterintuitive to designing a game for casual people. And bringing those two experiences together, it seems to be a really difficult challenge for a developer, right? Magic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a magic formula. Right. So <laughs> why, why, have, why have no companies ever made a game, I guess, with like two different modes? Where like you have this is the competitive mode that has tweaks on stats and, and, and commands and actions and things you can do, and this is the casual mode. Do you think there's just too big of a disconnect then between the competitive yeah. side? Yeah, or... I mean, well, I mean, you might as well just release two different games. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, you, like really, if you if you if you've got a similar game mode, but it's it's very different in terms of stats and stuff, you've literally got two different games. But it's something that you know I struggle with a lot because. Um, you know, I, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to make this 1v1 esport. Who's actually going to play this 1v1 esport? You know, or 1v1 game mode. I'm like, only competitive people. So I have to make team, team modes, but I have to match all the movement mechanics and all the kind of, you know, um, you know, uh, just, yeah, just gameplay. So it transitions you know, from one to the other. Otherwise, no one's going to care about the 1v1 unless people actually have a connection to the game. Because they won't understand how skillful the shot or move was. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's a very, I mean, I, it's yeah, it's it's I don't know. It's not easy to answer that question with you know something very precise like why aren't people, mm -hmm. you know, doing two different modes? I just think that you know when you release a game, you're meant to be releasing a, a product that doesn't confuse people, and that sure. product should be fun from every level of gameplay. And I think it's possible. I think it really is. I think if you try and do too much as a developer, you end up, you know, doing nothing well. Uh, um, you know, if if Overwatch wanted to, you know, do different game modes, I'm sure a lot of them wouldn't work. Just, you know, the some of the, you know, um, characters just be like Pharaoh just doesn't. Yeah, it's you know, not balanced for that. Those games. Yeah, and so I think you know having that uh, focus is is really quite um, important. Um, so you, we, we were just talking about how risky it is for any devs to take on an RTS at this point. I'd say the same thing is true for a dueling FPS at this point because it's been ages since we have it. And that's what you're taking on right now, uh, James. So wanted to talk to you about what you think, or even just all of us, about what we think the future of a dueling FPS is. And it sounds like you know, you're adding that team angle. You know, I guess that's kind of going to be your... your what is it doing? Oh, you know, you like quick. Like Duel is 1v1, right? 1v1. So basically, yeah. if people okay. are going to come, yeah. like 90% of the people that come and play our game that they play it will turn up to shoot each other and, and frag and have fun. And then there'll be a 10% that like dueling, and then there will be 1% of those duelers that will want to really like, you know, and populate the dueling servers for a period of time. Um, so we're actually kind of not... Um, I mean, we're, we're just bringing the 1v1, and we can only spend a certain amount of money on it because, you know, in terms of the return... It's it's more as a, you know, we we have to focus on the other game modes to build a player base, and the one v one is our esport focus, but it should also be fun. Um, I think it's a huge risk. I'm willing to take it because I want to see all the pro gamers that I've known, you know, be able to play pro, and I think they're fantastic. And I think the game modes really fun to watch as an esport. I mean, it would be like if no one made StarCraft two, you know, we wouldn't, you know. Like what would have happened, you know, in, in esports, right? With all these personalities, they wouldn't be here. Um, and so I think, um, 
you know, I owe a lot to the Quake community for where I am, and I, that's why I wanted to make the game. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that FPS will come back either with me in 1v1, or it might come back with id Software, maybe something new, probably not Doom, maybe Quake 5 is around the corner, or Admiral Tournament will go big. Um, but I think, I think um, FPS, similar to how Jeff described RTS, as a 1v1, if that's your main eSport, uh, has a really big design challenges to it more so than a lot of other games which are probably naturally from a core just more fun to play you know this team game is more fun because i play with friends and this is more fun because i get to focus on one character not a whole army in a, a colony um so i think yeah it's just um whether or not we're going to do it well um you know across the board of all the people making the 1v1 genres um you know i would trust valve to make a 1v1 you know, I would trust Blizzard to do a 1v1 because there's, an, there's certain elements that they will bring into the um, uh, development, like, for example, the feedback of the game and, uh, you know, how it's promoted, which will contribute to the success way more than maybe id Software would or uh, even myself. Sure. You'll um, do so great. Yeah, but unfortunately, there's not a you know you don't you don't have everything going for you right as a company. So you have to do what you, you're you're trying to do and do it well, because um, like Reflex. They've got great developers. You know, their engine gets pushed. It, you know, it feels money. good. It's to mostly game. money. But, like, but the, yeah, but Reflex are lacking. You know, good art. They're lacking connections. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're lacking. Their gameplay isn't innovative enough, in my opinion, off the previous successor that it's trying to be. Um, you know, it, it doesn't really go anywhere. Unreal has a problem, right? Because it's called Unreal Tournament. So everyone's like, "Well, you better give me just Unreal." And it's like, well, maybe Unreal isn't the epitome of FPS gaming. You know, maybe there's a problem with how the weapons work because as a spectator, if all your most of your weapons are hit scanned and you have double dodge mechanic, mm -hmm. no one's getting in each other's faces. So it's very boring because everyone's fighting from mid range. And Quake didn't have that problem because it had this natural flow. So you would corner people and it would actually be exciting and fun to watch and play as an esport. Um, so there's so many design problems with the 1v1, similar to the RTS, that need to be overcome to make it successful. And yeah, who knows who's going to crack it, but I'll give it a shot with the guys that we work with. Have you heard anything about D9's game? Um, isn't it called it's Artillery or something? It's an the RTS company game. is Artillery. Yeah, the company yeah. is Artillery. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that Day9's got a good shot. I mean, I like if I was him, I would talk to a lot of pro gamers. I would talk to a lot of community members. I would only talk to them on an individual basis. There's a, there's a problem when you get feedback. If you take it as a group, people mob you. Uh, Ice Frog does this thing where he literally just talks to people very on an individual basis and then uses all the information himself rather than let people go on a forum and say, this is broken. And then 100 people say, yeah, and start and agreeing. Feel as a developer that you have to change it. Um, so, yes. Yeah, certainly day nine can have a chance but it, there's i mean you're going to make thousands and thousands of decisions you know as a developer um and you need to get the best decisions almost every time you know for that magic kind of you know feeling of you know this is you know more than we've ever expected it to be so he has yeah. a shot but i've never heard of anyone playing his game or testing it or anything so i don't know you know jeff I, what are your thoughts he's got a jeff what are your th thoughts on 1v1 FPS. You think uh, the esports scene right now is dying to have have that be part of it? Uh, what I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of uh, my opinion on this might be even tainted because I just I'm friends with James, DJ Weed, and like these other guys, sure. even Slasher, who like that's fine. Yeah, that is where they came from. It's their holy ground, and and I I grew up watching Quake as well. Like it was it was one of the it was the other FPS genre. Like everyone was playing 1.6. And then everyone was also going goo goo and gaga over the epic showdowns in, in Quake. Like they are just, they're legendary. They live mm -hmm. on YouTube to this day. So um, I definitely think it's it's much in the same way as like StarCraft, where there's a, there is an audience of people that if those games came out and did well, they would watch it. They would, they might not even necessarily play it, which is super unique. I think most games this, in this day and age are, are the player base that's watching those games. Um, but StarCraft's like the exception to that, and I think a arena or one v one FPS. Would also you join find it. Is it is would that be enough to support uh, as a support the game as a dev? 
James, if it was only a watchable game versus well, not like, only I say I just say I that it can't. Well, even I actually, as a question, I think though, that, like, I think that was one of the worst survive? things. Could one of the survive? worst things about StarCraft Two is that the fan base was always like, "Oh no, StarCraft Two is so cool because so many people watch it that don't play it." I think that's totally unsustainable and that's totally well, delusional. It's unique it about the game, though. So, but 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 yeah, yeah, it's, it's and that's one of the reasons why StarCraft died is because nobody. I mean, Destiny is kind of like correct. If you're thinking this, what you would say is you would say like if i'm running esports for this game and i'm supporting it as a developer we're pulling resources into this so if people are watching our game and then they don't come and play this is failed marketing but, but also unfortunately, it's not by design like they didn't make starcraft so that you yeah. would watch and not play it they want you to play it it's just yeah. it just happens that a lot of people are okay watching it without playing it which is very unique is, is my point yeah. not that it was like designed that way but james yeah, is no, in a, james is in a unique, unique position where he's making the game no, from the standpoint but, of being an yeah. esport, so I mean, there were many things that I thought then like StarCraft would be really fun because if StarCraft was getting all this marketing but had a paywall, I would really think it would be great if people could just come in and maybe just have multiplayer for free, but also upgrade mm -hmm. to like campaign or something. But I think StarCraft still made the most of its money off just box sales, you know, from you know the whole hype of StarCraft and its campaign. And people, I don't think many people came in off its marketing um, kind of esports prowess. Um, but from, I mean, we're doing stuff from a business side that would make sure that when people watch the game, they will be able to come in and find something fun they want to play. And that is very important to us to make a business decision, which is, you know, you've seen the game, we're at this DreamHack tournament or wherever, it looks fun. You're going to come in, you probably won't play 1v1, but there's this side of the game that you will enjoy, hopefully. And like, StarCraft didn't really maybe have that, you know, apart from the campaign or playing with a friend or a 2v2 or it's later it got the so arenas and uh, not the arenas, the um, arcade. Yeah, you know? the arcade. Yeah. So I don't know. So still pretty traditional then. Still pretty traditional kind of business model. I mean, you want them to play the game and monet you know, e monetize the game. Yeah, the people that win the most from game development, um, sorry, from esports, is always a developer, right? Like ESL, MLG, they're not like rinsing it because they get, you know, to run tournaments. You know, they make money through business to business selling numbers. And But the game developer is like, we're actually getting a customer and we've got, and from this, you know, we've actually got a product. Um, so all these, yeah, so esports is a, it's a business. It's... Um, I'll answer your question too, by the way. I actually think... James and his company making a 1v1 FPS is the smartest thing they could have done. Because imagine if he's designing a game that's like another CSGO <laughs> yeah, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. We already saw what happened. Like, to go into those scenes as established as they are, like Heroes did, is so rough. It takes Blizzard, a juggernaut, to put in like the third best effort. And there's probably, and this is just being fair, I, I love Blizzard, but like a gigantic chasm between heroes and its viewership and its player base etc versus the other two right mm -hmm. yeah so if you go into that sphere you're going to get your ass handed to you just by the way it is but to go into the 1v1 fps sphere right now where quake isn't really i mean they've, they they came out with what the browser based old version yeah. of themselves. uh doom is i guess kind of looming out there but whether well, or not Mm -hmm. I mean, Doom, yeah. it, they did reviews on Doom already, and some of the news reporters were like, wow, this is really fast. It feels like Quake. And they're like, <laughs> and, you know, and they're like, yeah. And then people that have played it, they're like, it's slower than Halo. Wow. They're like, okay. the people who played it, like, Doom is slower than Halo. I don't know why they're telling you in these, like, articles that it feels like Quake, because it's not. But, you know, like, it, it have a new, uh, you know, engine. They've got people behind them. There's no reason that Quake 5 can't just come around the corner. And if, you know, and if they put money into it, sure, I've got nothing, you know, you know, maybe I won't have anything. But if I spend the right amount of money, I should at least get enough return. And if I've been able to, you know, if we, the company, have been able to complete the project and gained experience, maybe we'll take on, you know, a different game or another game. Or, you know, mm -hmm. if we have a customer base that's big enough to serve and, um and yeah. develop for that's fine you know we, you don't need to own the industry to be successful you just right. need to do what you do well and yeah so well do you think that free like freemium games do you think that's the only new like the only way to go now in terms of payment models? i think it's great for esports yeah. i mean you, they see the game uh -huh. download here 
I mean, we, when we did uh, Bloodline Champions, we went to an event that Jeff was at um, in StarCraft, uh, sorry, for StarCraft. And I told him, don't pay me for hosting, just show some Bloodline Champions adverts. And basically, we would get like, you know, just a few thousand signups a day. And then when we showed Bloodline Champions advert at the StarCraft event, um, we got 10 times the amount of signups. And so just because they were able to play the game for free, we esports, you know, mm -hmm. was very quickly became the best marketing we ever had for this game, more so mm -hmm. than mainstream marketing. But I think marketing has changed now because marketing used to be like just this one YouTube video from Total Biscuit or this, you know, one, you know, it used to be like <laughs> that. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. But I don't think people trust that anymore. Yeah, mm -hmm. people don't trust this kind of one hit wonder YouTube videos or this one review. They don't trust it anymore. And I think now marketing is uh, towards esports games and kind of, um, you know, for all these different medias of stream, it's become for, uh, more like you need to constantly see the, the product to actually really start trusting it and being like, oh, I'm actually hearing about this game for like the 10th time, you know, my friend, this streamer, this YouTuber, you know, this, and then they start coming in. So I think if we showed Bloodline Champions adverts at the StarCraft event today, we would probably have less signups um, because there's so many more free to play games and, you know, you, you, yeah, marketing. Seeing it, seeing it on a stream too, it also gives you a much more authentic view of what the game, what can you actually expect? If you see somebody streaming, like Lyric is streaming to 30, 40, 50,000 people, if you see him play it, like you pretty much know what to expect. Whereas YouTube videos, and, I, and I, I guess I blame advertisers and devs for this to some extent, can be really misleading in terms of what kind of experience can you actually get at a game as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, since we got off to a late start, I know you guys are. are uh need to get to some stuff too why don't we get in, why don't we do some q a before we get going here and actually one of the questions kind of covers one of the things i wanted to talk about too hugo 12th hoven asks what are your thoughts on the recent hire of mike sepso and steve bornstein by blizzard you know for this new esports division what do you feel blizzard what do you feel blizzard is working towards and how will this affect the way in which overwatch is broadcast as an esports so if the developers get the most out of doing esports, it's right mind to show what what um, right mind to do, kind of what Riot did, which is control it and do it well and make sure you can do it amazingly. So why not hire what you you know think and hope are the best people? Um, because it's the biggest return is on you. So the biggest cost should also be on you, which hasn't always been the case in esports. Um, long time ago, everyone paid for everything, you know, except the developer. And now it's kind of changing. Um, I think that, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they work on, you know, if, if people want it and there's a demand, or maybe they're kind of playing it down like, oh, we don't think it's going to be an esport and they're building like amateur season, you know, pro season, Road to BlizzCon incorporation with Overwatch, and they're just, you know, not hyping it up right now. I'm not surprised if they're doing something big um, with all their franchises. Um, yeah, because well, it makes sense. The I can't remember his name, but the non sepso guy, actually, if you read his, like, who he is and what he's done, he is a fucking wizard of turning things into huge productions. Like, I believe... Former CEO found... of ESPN and NFL exactly. Network. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the NFL Network, actually, that was one of the things they attributed to him is that he was just like, he started the NFL Network and then went gigantic. He was one of the founders of ESPN and it went gigantic. Like, he's just, he's he's a big, big deal in that sphere. So for that hire from, and I think it was, it's it, I think it's either, well, it's Blizzard and Activision anyways. Yeah, it's like together. The board that owns both of them, um, made this move. <clears throat> and it's just very obvious that it's like, okay, um, in the next couple of years, the desire is to take esports and make it into a TV production or whatever you want to call it, like just bigger, bigger and more official production. If it's not the TV, then it just means professionalizing it and monetizing it for the mainstream media. So it's it's exciting, but it's definitely something that we're not going to see any impact of on a on our level for maybe a year at the earliest, probably two years, something like that. Like it, it's going to take a little bit of time or maybe I'm completely wrong I've, and like I've tomorrow been... they 2016 State. sounds like there's a lot of things in the works with Blizzard. Um, obviously, nothing out in the open or anything like that. But it, it sounds like 2016 will will probably be a big big year for esports, or I, I feel like a step up esports wise for Blizzard. Um, Which every year has been. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'd well, imagine I mean a big step uh, I mean, money wise. I mean, I imagine their first uh, meeting would open up something like this. How do we turn esports into reality TV so people get addicted to it? Where we can rinse the customer. Oh, no, that's why they hired rinse. these people because they are smart enough not to say that. Rinse it's the, the other. 
say that shit. Oh but at the same that... time, huh? okay. But it's I think like British forget rich. No, brother. but it's it's like um, you know MMA. You look how big MMA got now. You know, of um, you know a few key people's hard work in marketing and promotion, and yeah, it's just. I mean, it, we're gonna. I mean, esports. Everyone's like, yeah, yeah. And it, 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 the developers have the opportunity to push it any way they want because they own the IP, right? They own it all. Mm -hmm. um, esports is really owned by the developer. If 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 Blizzard say no, ESL, we don't want you broadcasting any of our games. Then ESL lose, you know, a, you know, department. They lose something, you know. Um, so where they want to take it and what's best. Is, is you have to focus on your customer, and your customer is the people that uh, are watching, the people that are buying, uh, you know, even now betting. Like, there's a huge part of CSGO, which is like a lot of people might not play, um, which uh, there is a huge amount of players, but a lot of, you know, kids, uh, Dreamhack, I see, I walk around, are just betting skins, right? And that's actually <laughs> a huge contribution yeah. to the amount of people that are actually invested in the game. So these guys, uh, you know, Blizzard, they have this huge choice of where do they want to push esports who how do they want to control it what do they want to you know do and and the, your customer is uh, the viewer you're building a tv network right so how do you get people to invest into you know the uh, the esports side and that's why i joke about reality tv because the biggest way to get people to invest into esports is to get them connected to the players because the most interesting part of esports is people Right. And that's mm -hmm. why I say that esports is turning into reality TV because we care more about the stars and the fandom um, element of actually the result of the match. You know, sure, we like hearing some post game analysis every now and then, but sometimes it seems that like people like hearing this guy was shit, this guy is good, very extreme. Because you'd rather see pictures yeah. of like Dyrus crying after winning. Yeah, because that's how you're going to remember that moment. That's great TV, right? That's great esports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and as I said, like, um, yeah, there's a whole crazy amount of combinations that are going to make it, um, you know, what's going to happen with esports, where it could go. But your customer is viewers right now. So there's a lot that I say we can learn from TV, but TV's also gone many places that I don't particularly overly like, the extremes of reality TV. But okay. yeah, I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna ask you that too. Like with all these deals now with Turner and and ESPN and things like that, you, you were there when when. Uh... You know, esports went to TV the first time around. So, what do you think about it this time around? Is it looking more promising to you, or it looks about the same? So, we're just gonna have to hold our breath and see how it goes. The only people that want to watch uh, esports on TV are the people that understand the genres. So they can understand the skill. Outside of that, they just uh, can only understand people's human emotions and um, storylines around those players. You know, this guy came from. You know, Pakistan had to sell his bike to get to an internet cafe and now, you know, goes here and, and, and wins, right? That's a storyline that if you open up a show with, that might captivate you to watch. But will you enjoy the game? Probably not unless you understand the, the genre's basics if you have an experience with it. So going to TV is still a mistake, and you know, but gaming gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I'm sure that it will probably end up on TV, but TV won't be what TV is anyway now, so it doesn't really fucking matter. So fuck TV. Yep. People will just be watching their streams through their yeah. TV. <laughs> exactly. So. All right, next question um, has to do with there's something we talked about like last week, but uh, Je Jeff, since you're here, and obviously James, mm -hmm. we will end latest news from Africa too, or Africa is that you know they're now banning match fixers too. So we're, we're definitely seeing these streaming platforms banning you know, former um, match fixers in, in certain the StarCraft 2 space. Uh, what do you, how do you feel about that, Jeff? I am completely in support of it. Okay. All right. Because, Stephen, I know you, you weren't in support of that. I mean, like, conceptually, it sounds good. I just, it just gets really, I don't know. It's just, it's an area that I don't want. I don't know. It's an area that I feel like streaming platforms making that decision is very iffy. Like, for instance, like Soda Poppin, like, should he be allowed to stream on Twitch? Because he's been banned from Warcraft before for breaking rules. Like, I like you get into like really he, weird areas there, I think. I think if he was the, the booker for like a <laughs> match fixing grand finals at BlizzCon in World of Warcraft, yeah, I think he should be banned from Twitch, probably. If, and it's not, it's not like Twitch.